Hello, War Gamers. Welcome back to Purple Druid Presents War Game Culture. Tonight we have a special treat. We're going to have a little chat with Elf Finder General, who is running a campaign and has added mass combat for, I think, the first time. And he's been using a variety of rules, trying to sort out what's going to work best for him. And I thought that would fit in well with our ongoing series here on the channel about testing out various mass combat systems for fantasy role-playing games. So Elfinder General has been mainly using the uh, Adventurer Conqueror King system, the core rulebook, and a smattering of chainmail, swords and spells, domains at war, and the solo wargaming guide um, for setting up campaigns. So without further ado, I will introduce Elfinder General and we'll go from there hey good to be on uh i'm glad you invited me and we're going to talk about a little bit of mass combat uh i guess out of the way i'm really new to wargaming i've not really grown up with it uh i've been playing D, &D or i should say axe and AD, D for about two years now and various campaigns run by different players and this was my first time i've been running a a session or a session a campaign since february now and while i have kind of ran some mass combat twice before this is the first time where i think it's really kind of just click in my game and just to see how what that does to your game and how that can change it I haven't seen quite the full effects yet, but I got a feeling I'll be seeing that this Friday. Uh, I know I did let my players know the results, and they were shocked at what happened. Uh, what happened was I had a dwarf faction, and they had found a natural chamber through mining. And through that natural chamber, they had found another natural chamber. And they sent down a scout, and he dropped down about 100 feet. And as he was walking, the rope gave a sharp tug, and it was going real fast, and then it just went slack. Well, the uh, leader of these dwarves, Duran Duran, decided to gather up 60 of his men. I don't know if I would call them dwarves, but let's just call them men. And they decided to go down the hole and see what was there. Uh, he... I, to make things kind of simple on me, I gave all of his forces, all of his force except for him and the cleric, just uh, a flat 6 HP. I gave them a short bow and a sword and leather armor and with a shield. That's it. And obviously light sources because an axe, dwarves can't see in the dark like they can in other versions of, of the game. Which was, it was kind of weird finding that out through play, but... It, it also kind of made things a little bit different, and I like that. And my idea was, I had rolled up through AD&D &D what was going to be in this chamber. I rolled up some orcs, and there was going to be a cleric among them. Um, obviously, I made a chieftain for the orcs as well. Fire beetles were in there. White apes were in there. And then, obviously, mushrooms, because it's subterranean area. You want some glowing, giant mushrooms. I mean, you know, it's D&D. &D. It's something about that weird and wonderful aspect to it. On top of that, I also wanted just to throw something in there as well to kind of see how things would do. I don't know until I start playing how things are going to go. And I threw in what's called a uh, Gloom Crawler. It's not in an AD&D 1E. &D &E. It's in a... The Axe supplement called Barbarian Conquerors of Kanahu. This thing is pretty much just like a giant squid, but instead of in the water, he crawls along the floor in the underground. He has eyes in his tentacles, and he's he's pretty devastating. But I didn't know what was going to happen until we started. 
And as far as the orcs go, there were about 30 in number, except for the orc chieftain and the orc cleric, or I guess in this version it'd be a shaman. And they had a little village in the chamber. I decided to, instead of using square a square uh, grid paper like you normally would for a dungeon, I went with hex because I felt like it didn't give it quite as cramped feeling. And because of that, I also decided to make it, instead of trying to be uh, use dungeon rules, I would use make it just wilderness. Each hex is about 50 yards. I felt like that was probably better just to use wilderness for that. From Chainmail, I used the terrain features where, depending on the terrain, you know, things are more difficult. And the dwarves, they landed in the vegetation or in the, I guess I call it a forest. And they wouldn't be able to form up into groups until after they left that forest. I also, since it was such a large number of dwarves, once they formed up, they would form up in three groups. And each group would get a single to roll hit using a d20, just pretty much axe standard combat, except instead of using individual initiative, the axe does, I went with group initiative, as, as I've been doing with my regular game. I just like it. group initiative better. It's faster, but it's also more brutal. Kind of keeps your, keep you on your toes a little bit. And let's see, as far as the orcs are concerned, I also gave them uh, 6 HP with the exception of the cleric and the chieftain. And I divided them within three groups. Uh, oh, as far as the, I guess I'll call them the hero characters. The Duran Duran, his cleric, and the orc chieftain, and his shaman. I let them roll separately instead of being part of larger groups. For the initiative. Yes, they, they, they would get their own separate roles instead of being just part of one of the larger forces in their groups. As far as the gloom crawler goes, from the description of the book, they sleep for the most part. They're dormant. So what I did was, starting with turn one, there was going to be a 50-50s chance of him waking up. That was going to continue until combat joined, and then when combat happened... It was going to increase about 15% chance with each round of combat, depending on how long that lasted. I didn't, I didn't even get to that for, I think it was round three, and he woke up. Now, he's slow, so it, took him, it takes him a while to get anywhere, but that was all right, because like I said, it's, this entire battle took 20 rounds to do, and... Yeah. I decided that the dwarves, since this was going to be unknown territory for them, and unlike other versions of D&D, they can't stay in the dark, they'd have to have torches, I decided that they were going to be slow, just to be cautious. Um, obviously, they don't know what's down here, other than the fact, possibly the dead body of their comrade. And I had two orc patrols, each one, two group, two made up of two orcs, and they were they're just normal patrols that were going to go out and scout around the forest and just around the area. And outside of the village, I have four groups of Shriekers. And obviously, the orcs know about the Shriekers. They're going to move away from them. But anything else wouldn't know. And they would trigger the Shriekers, and the Shriekers would go off and cause a bunch of noise. They would signal the village if they haven't already been signaled that something was on their something was coming their way and uh, the orcs the two patrols i decided that if they were to catch the dwarven parties by surprise instead of engaging in combat they would just go back to the village and let them know what was coming uh let's see what else is there well that sounds like a fun way to get that started now did you do this with the players or did you just run this off uh, behind the scenes, as it were. Behind the scenes, just by myself. It was a very interesting exercise to do. Um, it took a little bit longer than I expected, but I I didn't mind that. Because I guess with what I had written down and sticking to what I had written down, it made things exciting, if that makes sense. It, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. Even if I sometimes may have an idea, like, oh, this is probably going to happen. No, no, that didn't. That didn't turn out 
which I wouldn't have never thought about doing that, doing solo, because you're playing against yourself. But with using dice, you, there's that random that randomness that will change things up, and I, and that's something I really appreciate about uh, D and D and Axe and I guess war gaming generals. Definitely, the dice have a huge effect on the game, and they can make even solo games a lot more fun. I mean, I've been playing a bunch of solo games over the past year or so, and I've seen people playing solo games on YouTube, etc., and I didn't think it would be that much fun because, oh, I know what both sides are going to do, but number one, the dice themselves can take the game out of your hands, and then number two, oh, yeah. if you really don't want to know what's going on, like you saw in the solo campaigns book, there are some different tools that you can use for, you know, setting up those choices and kind of letting an AI, as it were, uh, make choices for you. And then you have to roll with them and, and make the best for for both sides. They, you know, the AI or the, or the list may choose, may make selections that you would not have made, but then you have to implement those and it can really stretch your imagination. It, it does. Um, and there were two other things with the Orc Force, even though they had a smaller number, I gave them, as long as they were going to stick to their village, I would give them a plus two on a, a to hit and for morale. And also, once whatever opposing force, in this case it would be the Dwarves, were to reach their village, they would let loose some captive fire beetles, giant fire beetles that they have, that they, I guess, harvest, use like sheep or cattle. And four white apes that they keep. And the white apes, I gave 20 HP each. Uh, the fiery beetles, I gave, I'm thinking, maybe 8 HP. And there was 20 of those that they would use. Um, and if things got real bad, I would have it where the orcs would take their women and whatever children they have and survivors. And there's a tunnel underneath the temple that they've made. That would lead to down below. But it was only going to be like a last resort. I also, in case the women had to fight, the female orcs, I, I should say, if they were to have to fight, they would only receive just one HP. So that way any attack would just kill them off because they're not really fighters. And just to make things simpler and easier to keep up with. Uh, just like why I gave the regular orc force 6 HP and regular dwarf force 6 HP. Once the orcs were alerted, Oh, did you uh, did you draw out those forces on a map? Did you push index cards around? How did how did you manipulate the forces? You know, was it in your imagination, or did you make some sort of representation on the table? The uh, hex paper I've got that I drew the map on, uh, I just drew on that. I didn't even really have to use a ruler because it's they because it's already kind of I guess you can say measured out. So all I did was just draw arrows. I put initials down for each force, because I didn't really have room to draw a large force of each group, so I just used the initials, like the Dwarf Force Group 1, whatever, Orc Force, Orc Patrol 1, Orc Patrol 2, uh, the Gloom Crawler, I would just write, you know, GC, OP, DF, and I would point it, draw arrows down to where they're moving, moving. Now, that's pretty much about it. I mean, I would like to get a a good sized table and push stuff around because that's uh, I have to admit I always like like that even as a kid but you know it's uh, just working with what I have I think it turned out okay I think it's important though whatever you use you whether it's wargaming or d d you have to keep up with what you know like uh, you know the strict time records you have to keep that and what Kai Gak said I think that also applies to uh, something like mass combat, where you need to really keep up with where everything is, you know, to keep it as fair as possible. Oh, definitely, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, even if you, even if you, even if you're just playing, you know, solo like me, and that way you don't forget, you don't, you're not second guessing, like, uh, did, did I move them here or was it, or was it here? No. And then I would also write down for each turn uh, on notebook paper. I've got two pages of it front and back on each one i was almost almost thinking i'd have to get a third sheet but i managed not to 
And that that also kind of kept me in line, making sure I'd stick to what I had written down rule wise. So, so you didn't forget anything or leave anything out? No. Uh -uh. And then look at it later and say, oh man, this would have changed the whole battle. I forgot yeah. to do this. There were a couple of times where, uh, when they, for an example, when they came across the white apes, they managed to kill three of them, and that left one of them alive. And I did forget about that single white ape uh, for a couple of turns, but only because of the main dwarf force engaged the main orc force. And I had, you know, a shaman. He was, uh, I think he cast a, there's a spell, an axe called a uh, holy chant. Dwarf cleric didn't get a chance to cast anything. He got killed fairly early on once they engaged the orcs. Durandarin, he got killed not long after that. I think he, he the first combat he did with the orcs, he got nearly half half of his HP taken down. And then uh, a few turns later, he was done for. Which, which kind of surprised me. I, I Like I said, you know, even when you're playing with yourself and even if you're using kind of cobble together makeshift rules like I was, don't expect things just to go a certain way. Once the dice hits the board or hits the table, whatever you're using, everything's out the window. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, we'll see. And that's, that is the fun part about not playing out a story, but instead playing out a scenario. You know, you take a situation... And you say, side A is going to do this, and side B is going to do that, and we'll roll some dice. Yep. And yep. find out what happens. Um, and that way you're not trying to act out, you know, a script or anything like that. Uh, like you said, you know, it, it turned out a way you didn't expect. It was exciting. It was fresh. It was new. So that's really cool. I look forward to hearing more about future battles, especially if you settle on a on a rules format that works for you. Oh, absolutely. And I would also really love to hear about if you decide to, or if it happens in a session where you get a chance to run a mass combat, you know, because your players are traipsing through the wilderness and they encounter a patrol of 70 something orcs, because that would be a lot of fun. Uh, I've done that, you know, live combat uh we both i think were involved with that in the other uh acks campaign where we got waylaid by some bandits uh so we did a small mass combat there but yeah it's it's fun to do these in a session as well what would you say was the most unexpected or surprising part of this combat two things that kind of surprised me on this was that the uh giant fire beetles really weren't all that effective until later on Early on, they just kept missing and missing. And with 20 of them, I divided them into two groups. Each group would get one hit. And so, you know, if if, if they hit, I think the, the damage for Fiery Beetles was 2d4. You know, you, you multiply that times 10. That's, that's a good bit. That surprised me. And the Gloom Crawler surprised me. Because what happened was, eventually... The Dwarven Forts, what was remaining of them, I'm thinking it was eight. Uh, I mean, the Orcs took a good hit. They were down about half. But the Dwarves, they, they finally retreated and pretty much right into the arm, or I should say arms of the Gloom Crawler, because he has like ten of them. And if you've read the stat block for that, it it's a nasty piece of work. He pretty much wiped them out, the remaining ones, in one go. And that, that surprised me, too. Him and the dwarves met at the same time, and that was it. You win some, and you lose some, don't you? Definitely. And what I did after that, though, what I was kind of curious with, when you have a death of a faction leader, how is that going to affect the rest of his faction? Not just the ones here but the ones up above, and what I did was, after a few days of them not getting any word at all from the 60-so doors that they sent below, 30 more volunteered. They went down, they found the orc village, which had been abandoned by the orcs, because once they saw the gloom crawler coming their way, they decided to haul butt and go back down below, 
Well, the dwarves, obviously, they don't know what's going on, so they find the orc village, go into the temple, find the uh, gloom crawler. He takes out ten of them, and then they, they, they do a good bit of damage on him, almost kill him, but they didn't get away. He gets them, and I decided to roll morale for the remaining dwarves up top to see what would happen, and they broke. Many of them left, some stayed, but most have left. Now, when you say they broke, that's because their leader was killed in the expedition. And I really thought that was an interesting thing to do because it's realistically what would happen. You know, let's say the Hobbit. You know, when Smog he comes in, and yeah, he kills a lot of dwarves, but once he kills, you know, they, you know, they're forced out and they just kind of scatter. They don't just stay in one group anymore. And that's kind of, you know, I wanted to see if that what would happen. So I just rolled the dice, and there you go. Now you have a whole bunch of groups of dwarven refugees straggling around in the wilderness in your campaign. That's awesome. That's a lot of fun. You can definitely have some fun with that, I'm sure. Absolutely. Or my players will. <laughs> say how they handle the situation. Or don't. Or don't, yeah. Absolutely. They might just let it go. So, uh, Elfinder General, what would you say is the biggest takeaway from... Don't be afraid to try it out. Don't be intimidated by doing it. And don't be too surprised that it will take your game, even one where the forces in this particular mass combat were fairly small. Don't be surprised where that can take your game to. It's really fun. And, it's, and it really, to me, just shows that mass combat is a core part of D&D. And always has been, even though it's kind of been forgotten over the decades, unfortunately. But, I mean, you know, heck, d and started as a supplement, technically as a supplement to Chainmail. And I think, really, at its core, d and is still a war game. Um, and if you read the pulps that inspired d and like I mentioned Conan, yes, he goes on adventures, but, you know, he may have one story where it is mass combat, like Hour of the Dragon first beginning of that that story it's mass combat he gets defeated and then it kind of he's going from place to place until he's able to take back what's his definitely and it's always exciting to have the game be new and unexpected for the game master or dungeon master as well as for the player don't think oh mass combat that's something you do letter level no 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 don't be afraid to do it now you can easily do that now that is a great point. One of the interesting things about mass combat and incorporating this into your game is how it can change the course of political interactions and interactions between players and NPCs, right? Absolutely. For instance, I had a player who's going to come up to the door faction. Uh, they call it our their little kingdom, is Arcadia. They're going to come up here, they're going to ask for help to defeat a vampire this Friday, and that's changed. You know, they're they're still going to try to come up here and maybe see what they can salvage anything to help them, but it's, it, it's not the sure thing as it was before. And don't be afraid to let, you know, let that happen in your game. It's, you know, let go, just let it happen. See where it takes you, you and your players. Yep, and then just hang on and go for the ride. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Elfinder General, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. And I definitely am excited to see another person getting involved and in trying out these rules and inserting this awesome part of the role playing experience into their campaign. This is Purple Druid for Wargame Culture signing off. And we will definitely have Elfinder General back for another show. Yeah, I hope so. And it was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks. Have a good night. All right, you too. Thanks, Wargamers, for hanging around. Please hit like and subscribe and stay tuned for more great Wargaming content. Mm -hmm.